Good morning. Hello, ladies. Welcome. Glad to have you here. If you're new, we're really glad to have you here and join us for your first time. We hope you have a great morning. If you'd like to come out of the tables and up to the seats up front, we'll have worship and teaching. And also, if you didn't get the handout for today's teaching, they're over on the table over here, as well as the study packet that we're currently working on. And if you like to work ahead, I know some of you are high achievers and like to move forward quicker than everything, everybody else, we'll have the next packet out on February 8th, so be looking for that. Um, also, if you have anything you would like prayer for, um, any needs, or just want somebody to come alongside of you and pray, we have an area over here as well that you can pray. Somebody will be there to pray with you. And um, welcome again, and have a great morning. All right. Well, good morning, ladies. Last week when Leash was here leading in my place, I was on a Disney cruise having the time of my life and relaxing and sitting by the pool. But I missed you guys and I missed Wednesday mornings and getting to be with you because it is just such a bright spot in my week and I hope it is for you too. And I love the passage that we're in today when Jesus heals the man that was born blind. And I love this little like conversation that happens right at the beginning. And I want to just read it right now before we worship. It says, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And I read that and was just reminded of the fact that when God works, when God moves in our lives and however he sees fit, it's always for his glory. And what a gift it is to get to be invited into that kingdom and to get to be vessels that he uses to display his glory and to display his power. And I don't know what you are all walking in with today. I know what some of you are walking in with, but I hope that today we will just be reminded that we have a miracle working, saving God who loves us, who is powerful, who is working in our lives and who we can trust with all of our circumstances and know that at the end of the day, it's all about him getting the glory and the praise. And so I'm going to invite you to get to your feet and we are going to worship our God here today. Just one word You calm the storm that surrounds me Oh, just one word The darkness has to retreat Oh, just one touch I feel the presence of heaven Oh, just one touch my eyes are open to see, my heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that He can bow. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. We believe that. Oh, just one word. You hear what's broken inside. Just one word, and you revive every dream. Yes, you do. Oh, just one touch, I feel the power of heaven. Oh, just one touch, my eyes are open to see. My heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that he can bow. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a prison wall he can't break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can this over our situations I will believe for greater things there's no power like the power of Jesus let 
faith arise, let all agree, there's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things, there's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree, there's no power like There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like His power. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. We sing it out. There's nothing that our God can't do. our story. Hallelujah, I'm free. Jesus, my Savior, rescue. Hallelujah, I'm free. Amazing grace, how sweet. Oh my 
my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace my chains my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me in like a flood His mercy reigns unending love amazing grace we sing the Lord has promised the Lord has promised good to me is where my hope secures he will my shield and portion be as long as life as we sing this out. Strong and worship 
you and if it puts me in the fire i'll rejoice cause you're there too i won't be formed by feelings i hold fast to what is true and if the cross brings transformation then i'll be crucified with you cause death is just a joy into resurrection life and if i join you in your suffering then i'll join you in our eyes and when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints my heart will still be singing my song will be the same oh christ be magnified let each please arise we sing oh christ be magnified from the altar That is our prayer, that you would be magnified in our lives, that you would be made much of. Thank you for the reminder today that it is always and forever about you getting the glory and the ways that you choose to work in our lives and move in our lives. I pray that we would be people that trust that you are working all things out for our good and for your glory that we would hold fast to that truth. We thank you for the gift of getting to gather, getting to be in community, getting to come into this place and getting to sing your praises and lift your name high and what a gift it is to be welcomed into that kingdom, to be your children who you saved from ourselves, from our sin and our shame, and that you would invite us into this. And what a gift that that is. I pray that we would never take that for granted that we would worship you with everything we have every moment of the day because you alone are worthy. We love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. Ladies, you can stay standing and Dixie's going to come read our passage. Hi, ladies. Christ indeed. I mean, that the scripture as we studied this week, that song just encapsulates everything that we've been reading. So if you would open your Bible to John 9, we're going to go through verses 1 through 12 together. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Well, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with his saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Is this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, it only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they asked. He replied, The man they they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and I washed and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. Let's pray. Father, you are so mighty. You are so great. And you are to be magnified. Your glory is beyond our understanding, Lord. 
but we thank you for sharing in your word what we can know about you, Lord. You are sovereign. You are mighty. You are the great healer. You are beyond truly our comprehension, but you are good and you are gracious and you are merciful. I pray as Roberta reads through scripture and teaches us the truth of your word, that our hearts would be changed, that we would understand more of who you are, your love for us, and your capability of taking care of us. We love you and we commit this night to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good evening. How are y'all tonight? Are you awake? (laughs) Summer's coming. It's coming. But I guess it was one of the longest days today, wasn't it? Like there was, it made the news that we had actually a sunset this evening. Isn't that, it made the news only in Seattle. So ladies, I want you to, here's some force fun on you. Um, I'd like for you to turn to a friend and I'd like for you to tell them this. Okay, when we, when we all get to heaven, we're going to see Jesus. Are we excited? Oh, and we all go, yes. But we're also excited to see somebody else, like our heroes, like Paul, Peter, Moses. So I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell who's the next person you're looking forward to seeing in heaven. Okay, turn to your neighbor and tell him. I'm excited to see Paul. Who wants to meet Paul? Don't you want to ask him a few questions? Like, what was that thorn in the flesh thing? I'm excited to meet Moses. You know, like Charlton Heston, Moses. Right? Remember? We can remember that. What about Peter? Right? We can relate to him, you know. Mm, mm, mm. Right? We're so... we. We have so much to look forward to. But we have so much to look forward to now. Because if you are delivered from sin, if you are saved by grace, you have a calling upon your life. And I want to ask you this, because we're going to be talking about persecution tonight. And we're also going to be talking about rejection tonight. So have you ever been in a situation that you have had to really stand up for your faith? How many of you have been in that situation? Have you ever been in a situation that you had to stand before someone that had authority over you, that you had to really stand up for the Lord? What about personally? I think some woman is trying to come in the door. Okay, look, welcome to Bible study. We, yeah, let's all. Yeah. We thought you were locked out. Sorry to embarrass you. She'll never come again. Um, okay, Roberta gets serious. Okay. Let me, <laughs> never, somebody said. Okay. Let me ask you this. Has it ever been personal for you? Has it ever been somebody that you really love? that you've had to stand up for your faith. And I mean, I'm talking family member. I'm talking close family member. And I mean, it's risky, isn't it? It's risky. It's really risky because there's always that threat of rejection. There's always that threat of, will they ever talk to me again? But you know, when we stand up for Jesus, it's risky And it's hard, but it's worth it. It's worth it. We stand with Jesus because he is the light of the world. He is the light of the world. We stand with Jesus because he is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. He said this, whoever follows me will have the light of life. And these are the words of Jesus. So today's big idea, it's on your sheet. God's presence and comfort are given to those who suffer and are persecuted for their faith. So you've got three divisions here. The first is 1 through 12, the suffering and the healing of the blind man. Give your sheet, okay. Number 2, 13 through 34, the suffering of persecution and rejection. 
And the third is 35 through 41, the comfort of God's presence. So from 1 to 12, let's talk about this. Dixie was so gracious to read it for us. So when this man got up this morning, think about his life. His life changed, and he was going to have a busy day. This all happened in one day in this man's life. He had no idea that his life was going to change forever. As a matter of fact, he, the first day that he gets to see, he gets to see Jesus. Did you think about that? Now, so many people would pass this man every morning, every day, every afternoon. And you know, the people that would struggle physically, remember, this is a time that did not have medical care. And because of physical issues, people couldn't work. So they would stand outside the temple and they would beg. They would stand outside the temple and beg. So Jesus sees this man. He sees him. And I would just like to start with this. Jesus sees you. Even if you don't feel that right now, he sees what you're going through. He sees your pain, if it's physical, if it's emotional, even if you're struggling in your faith. Maybe some of you have some really hard questions. Maybe you're going through something really hard and you have some hard questions. He sees you and he loves you. Remember that. So Jesus sees this, mas this man and he has compassion on him. He has compassion. But the disciples look at him and they see him as a theological discussion. They see them as an opportunity to ask more questions about this man. Instead of seeing the man that needed help, they wanted to make it a theological debate. And they ask, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? You know, this is just bad teaching. This is bad teaching about suffering that the rabbis did at this time. We've talked about that. We've talked about the fact that this time people were really at the mercy of the teaching of these religious leaders. And they taught that anyone that suffered physically, meaning illness, had either sinned or their parents had sinned. Think about that. Think about that for a minute. This is bad teaching. It's wrong teaching, and it even happens today. Think of what this teaching would have done to this person. They would have been living a life of guilt and shame. They would live a life of rejection, of accusation. They were at the mercy of others. And then they're taught that this is their fault, Absolutely not. Terrible things happen to innocent people, and don't we know that? How many of you know exactly what I'm talking about? Terrible things. Think about children with cancer. Think about those who struggle with chronic pain, or maybe MS, or, or heart problems. You go to the doctor one day and you realize something's going wrong. These are the result of living in a very painful and hard world. Now, some of you are thinking, well, there is suffering from sin, yes, but this is called consequence. There's a difference. That's called consequence. This is not the case of this man born blind. As a matter of fact, Jesus confirms this, and Jesus is asked, who sinned? Who sinned? The theology debate starts, who sinned, Rabbi? Tell us. And Jesus said, being the all-knowing God, says, no one sinned, his parents didn't sin. Can you imagine how that man felt at that time? Can you imagine? But this happened so that the works of God can be displayed. God would use this situation to display his power and reveal himself so this man would know 
the true Son of God. But let's get real here. Let's get real. Suffering's hard, isn't it? Suffering's hard. Suffering makes us realize how incredibly vulnerable we are. But it also makes us realize how desperate we are for God, doesn't it? Suffering is hard, and this is when you and I look at Romans 8, and we have to believe what God says, that all things work together for good for those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. You know, Todd and I were in the car recently and talking about something that we're going through right now, and and he made the comment to me. He said, you know, Roberta, God allowed it. He's allowed it for some reason. Something good is going to come out of this. We have to trust that. We have to trust it. Verse 4, Jesus says, As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus was getting ready to illuminate this man, not just physically by giving him sight, but to illuminate him spiritually, to reveal who he is, to reveal his glory to this man. So Jesus, being the creator God, remembered Jesus, the word of God. He was at creation, and by him all things were created. There was nothing that was made that has been made. In him was life, and that light was the light of men. So Jesus starts to create. He takes saliva, which we all go, wow, that's interesting. And he takes and he creates and he makes mud. And he rubs it on the blind, the blind man's eyes. But just think, when he was at creation, he took the dust and he breathed life into Adam. He puts mud on the blind man's eyes. Then he tells the man to go to the pool of Salaam. What was that like? Did the man grab somebody's arm? Did he take hold of the walls? But all we know is he was obedient to God. He was obedient. He doesn't question it. He's obedient. He takes this risk of faith and he reaps a reward. We know that in this time people thought spit, or sorry, saliva, that sounds better, doesn't it? That saliva could actually cure at this time. They considered it medicinal. Well, after COVID, we know that's not true, right? (laughs) But Jesus did this so that the man would associate it with probably medical. Who knows? Who knows? But what caused this blind man to be obedient to Jesus? Did you think about that? What caused him to be obedient? Was it the compassion of Jesus? Was it the fact that Jesus saw him when no one else did? He wasn't a theological debate. He wasn't a problem He needed help. He needed help. Jesus saw him. He had compassion. Was it the words of Jesus? Or could it have been the touch of Jesus? Can you imagine Jesus touching you? Maybe he longed to see the light of the world. What was that like? So he makes his way to the pool, and he washes and he was healed, and he could see. In his case, seeing is believing. Think of this, never seeing light your life. Think of never seeing those around you. Think of this, first you go to the marketplace and you probably see the chaos going on and the colors and the food, how beautiful. You see the people, you see the trees, You see the temple and all of its splendor. You see the buildings. Maybe he looked at his own hands and his feet, and it goes on and on and on. So his neighbors saw him, and they asked about him. Is it him? No, it's just someone that looks like him. In other words, this just doesn't happen. As a matter of fact, 
In the Old Testament, there is never one record of anyone being saved, or excuse me, being born blind that has been healed. There's not one record of that. How were your eyes opened? The neighbors ask. The man Jesus. The man Jesus. Well, where is he? Almost like, I forgot about him. I don't know. I don't know. So the man had not seen him at this point. But think about this. This is the beginning of faith in this man. He had not seen Jesus. But this is the beginning of faith. He heard the words of Jesus. He obeyed his commands, even though they were hard and challenging. He followed his words. How hard it would have been for him to go to the pool, blind. He obeyed Jesus. I went to the pool and now I see, but yet he had not seen Jesus. So the takeaway is this. Jesus is the God of all compassion. He is the God of all compassion. It was the compassion of Jesus that saw the man. It is the compassion of Jesus that sees you and I in the midst of really hard things. And not only does he see us just like the man, he's actively involved. How many of you needed to hear that tonight? He's actively involved. Who knows Johnny Erickson Tata? Who knows who she is? Yeah, she is my hero. If you do not know who she is, buy her book, read it, and read it again. She's amazing. She has said this, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about her life. She said this, and I quote, suffering will show you who you are. How many of you know exactly what she's saying? Suffering will show you who you are. It will show you how much you know Jesus. When she took a dive in a shallow pool, or excuse me, it was a lake, I believe, her neck broke instantly. She was 17, and she was paralyzed from the neck down. She comes from a very athletic family. As a matter of fact, you probably know her family rode horses. They were big swimmers. You see videos of them lifting weights. It's just really funny, the whole family. But that was her life. She was 17 when she broke her neck and lost all of her ability to walk and to use her hands. She thought to herself, Lord, what have you done? This is wrong. She said she became depressed and she felt like God had deserted her. She said this, I was, when I was making plans to go to college, this is before she broke her neck, I was a Christian. And then I prayed, Jesus, Lord, grip me. Do anything to draw me closer to you. But then I broke my neck. How will I live like this? How will I survive? She said after she broke her neck and after she got used to the idea of being in a wheelchair, she met with Elizabeth Elliot. How many of y'all know who Elizabeth Elliot is? Okay, you need to read her biography too if you hadn't. Yeah, her audio biography. But she gave Elizabeth Elliot 10 steps on how to suffer. You know, what does it look like? Why does God allow suffering? And Elizabeth Elliot, if you've ever seen her, she um, had these very deep blue eyes, looked at her and said, Johnny, this is all very true, but it's very technical. Johnny said later in her life, she understood what she said by that. She said this, suffering is a matter of pressing us up against the Lord Jesus. We press in to Jesus. It's not about me. It's not about us. It's the heartbeat of Jesus. Knowing the heartbeat of Jesus, it's about knowing Jesus better. She said, I can handle the fact that I've broken my neck. I've had third stage cancer. 
but she said, I have nerve pain. So in other words, she can't feel from the neck down, but she has excruciating pain that she lives with. As a matter of fact, her husband rolls her over every two hours through the night. She has terrible nerve pain. She said, when it's hard, I go find Jesus. He is my hope. He's the only one that satisfies. This is the last quote I'm going to say by her, and this is profound. I would much rather be in this wheelchair knowing him the way I do rather than walking and not knowing the sweetness of the Lord. So suffering is hard, and it's painful. So I want to ask you right now, and this is truly between you and Jesus, how are you depending on God in the midst of your suffering? Do you see Jesus as the all-compassionate God that loves you and sees you, and that loves and sees me? You know, suffering comes in many forms. It can be physical. It can be mental. It can be emotional. It can be loneliness. It can be going through the suffering with someone we love. When our children suffer, we suffer, don't we? How is God showing you, even through this new study of John that we're doing, how you are loved by the living God? Jesus sees you, and he reaches down, and he sees you. And not only does he see you, he is empathetic with your suffering. He is the God of all compassion. So let's go on to the next division. We're going to read 13 through 17. Whoa, I lo almost lost my mic. That would have been good, huh? Okay, 13 through 17. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had born blind. Now that day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes with, was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But, but others asked, How can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, He's a prophet. So we healed the man. This healed man is brought before these religious leaders. And instead of celebrating this amazing healing that God has done, they throw water on the fire. How many of you have just been so excited about it? You've got so much joy and somebody goes like this to you. Do you know what I'm talking about? You walk in the door, you're just excited and everyone's like, uh, well, objection, objection, water. You know what I'm talking about? They just don't have the joy that you have. You know what I'm talking about too, don't you? Well, that's what happened with this man. And celebrate, instead of celebrating this beautiful healing, praising God for what God had done, because only God could have done this, and really looking into who Jesus was and trusting his word, they put this man on trial. And they start to ask him questions. So Jesus healed this man on the Sabbath. Now, this was a big deal. And according to the teaching of the Jewish leaders, which were man-made, can we say, they were not from God, no one was supposed to heal on the Sabbath. No one. You couldn't help a person that was suffering on the Sabbath. Isn't that interesting? And how insensitive. They were not to use medicine. They were not to use saliva. We still can't figure that out. Or lift mud. They weren't supposed to lift mud because it was like they were working. As a matter of fact, according to documents of what their teaching was, you could not even have a nail in your pocket. It was just ridiculous. So the Pharisees ask, how did you receive sight? And the man testifies, Jesus put mud on his eyes and he washed. And the first response is, this man is not from God. He does not keep the Sabbath. So this shows that Jesus has um, not only violated the divine Sabbath rules according to what they had um, put together, he did it on purpose. 
So he deliberately violated traditional Sabbath regulations that they had come up with to prove that it was not true. Because Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. That's what the Bible says in Luke 6, 5. And he also says, as long as my father's working, I'm working. So they ask the man, what do you say? It's your eyes he opened. He's a prophet. I love this. God is building faith in this man. He's building faith. And he knows the risks. He is standing before people that can change his future, quote unquote. But he's bold and he proclaims that he knows these religious leaders, he knows what they're thinking, and he is not ashamed. So they call his parents. Don't you think that's funny? They called his parents. He's a grown adult, they call his parents. Go to verse 19. Is this your son, they asked. Is he the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? And can't you see they're like, uh, we know he's our son. The parents answered, and we know he was born blind, but how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him, he's of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already decided that anyone that acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he's of age, ask him. You know, this is very significant. This is very significant. These parents are put on the spot. And probably, I asked the first group and no one understood what I was talking about, so maybe you can relate. But have you ever watched any of those Jesus movies and like they show this scene and the parents look at the son and they have great compassion and they're crying, they're all excited for him. I don't see this as, have any of you seen a movie that does that? I am the only one that has seen that. Okay, well, just ignore that. Okay, so the parents are standing there and they are rejecting their son. Not only are they not answering the Jewish leaders, they have great fear of them, they're rejecting their son who was born blind. Ask him, he's of age. Ask him. They even tell the religious leaders to ask their son rather than them. They don't want the questions towards them. And why are they, why is this, why is this so significant? What does it mean for people to be thrown out of the temple? Well, it means this. First of all, it's total rejection from everyone around you in your community. You could not come into the temple you could not buy goods in the market. You were treated as an outsider. It meant no more connection with God because in those days the temple was the connection with God. It means you would be completely ostracized. That means no sacrifices, no feasts, no day of atonement, you were out. So instead of praising God, that their son had been healed and experiencing the joy that God had brought through healing, they refer the question back to their son. And there's no joy, just fear. They chose fear over faith. And the thing about fear is this, fear drowns out faith. How many of you know what I'm talking about? When fear comes in, Sometimes it overtakes us, doesn't it? And it drowns out joy. So they summon the man again. And at this point, I almost see him laughing and dancing. Because he's, I mean, think about it. He can see now. And the religious leaders say, give, God, give glory to God and tell the truth. In other words, it's like if you and I went to court and we were a... We, were, um, we observed a crime and they take us up and they'd have us put our hand on the Bible and say, tell the truth, so help you. It's like that. That's what they're asking him to do. It's like a vow. We know this man is a sinner. We know this man is a sinner. Go to verse 25. Whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? 
How did he open your eyes? And I love 27. He answered, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become one of his disciples too? <laughs> this is amazing. Absolute confidence in God. Absolute confidence. He cared less about what they thought and he became bold for the Lord, proclaiming what God had done. I was blind, and now I see. The Pharisees couldn't dispute it. And even after question, after question, after question, he even became sarcastic. Isn't that funny? He's exhausted with the questions. I just find that comical. But then what happens? They hurl insults at him, and yet he doesn't waver. I love that he starts to preach at them. He starts to give them a message. Go to 31 through 34. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of, of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. So he gives them a sermon. And the Pharisees reply, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out, meaning the temple. Persecution from authority. Persecution from those who were supposed to be the shepherds of God's people. Persecution from family, rejection from family, refusing to answer questions because of fear of man. These are those who choose fear over faith. But the blind man, I see almost smiling and happy. There's nothing that anyone could say that could convince him otherwise. I was blind and now I see. So the takeaway from this is this. Following Jesus means rejection and persecution. Following Jesus means rejection and persecution. You know, I know this is the reality for some of you. I know it's a reality you've been rejected or even persecuted by authority. You have been ignored or dismissed by family members. You've been canceled because of what you believe because you've chosen Jesus and the truth of his word, it's painful, isn't it? It's painful. You are the one that can say this, dear friend, I was blind and now I see. God has opened your eyes and he's opened my eyes so we can see his light, his truth. You see Jesus for who he really is. And just like Johnny Erickson Tata says, he is the only one that satisfies. He's the only one. Jesus sees you and he loves you and he has great compassion on you. So let's go to our last division, the comfort of God's presence. I want you to turn to your neighbor. You didn't, you thought you were not, yeah, I was gonna, yeah. Mm -hmm. Turn to your neighbor. Read 35 through 41. And read it with your friend or read it by yourself, okay? 35 through 41. Okay, ladies. I gave you a small one. I didn't give you 30 verses tonight. Isn't this so sweet of Jesus? Isn't this so sweet of Jesus? Jesus knows the man is thrown out, and he goes to him. He goes to him. And he just asks, do you believe in the Son of Man? Do you believe? Remember, this man had never seen Jesus. He'd never seen him. Jesus revealed to the man that he was more than a prophet. He was more than a man of God. He affirmed to the man that he is the Son of God, that he is salvation. You have seen him. He is the one speaking with you. Jesus presented himself as the only one that can save. Do you believe in the Son of Man? And the blind man didn't hesitate. 
Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. What did that look like? How sweet of the good shepherd to seek out the one that had been rejected. Jesus saw him, but what was so beautiful is the man born blind, in the small time that he could see, he got to see Jesus that very day. Isn't it amazing? Can you imagine being born blind and the first thing you get to see in that first day is Jesus? He saw the ugliness of the world in one day, and he saw the ultimate beauty in one day. That's how our lives are, ladies. We see some very sad things, but oh, we get the beauty of who Jesus is. The Word of God, the Word made flesh, and he was comforted by Jesus. To the point he worshiped him. I can't imagine he must have fallen on his knees maybe. Maybe he kissed his feet. Maybe he broke out in song saying, I was blind and now I see. Thank you, Lord. So the takeaway is this. God gives his perfect comfort to his children that suffer. The only way that he can. It's perfect. His comfort is perfect. You know, I know some of you in this room, you need comfort. You need comfort. I know some of you in this room need wisdom. You're going through a hard time and you need wisdom. I know some of you in this room who are spiritually blind and you just need Jesus. All you have to do is say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Come into my heart. Make me new. Save me from my sin. That's all you have to do. I want to know Jesus. Now, some of you are looking down here and going, Roberta, what are those apples down there for? Did you even notice them? Okay, I have a basket of apples. Well, it's not a basket. I don't know. It's, kind of, it's the bread basket we use at home. So I have a friend. Her name is Della. And Della is a woman who has really taught me about Jesus. And Della would tell a story. She said, you know, um, I, I grew up not knowing that my mother loved me. As a matter of fact, in my family, we did not say, I love you. And she said, for years, I would just wonder about my mother. But she said, what would happen is I would go to my closet, and in my shoe, she would put an apple. And that was her way of telling me that she loved me. And I would be having a really hard day, and I'd open my closet, and I would see that apple in my shoe. And I thought, oh, my mother loves me. I would like to tell you, you are the apple of God's eye. He told the Israelites, you are the apple of my eye. I don't know what you're going through, but you are the apple of God's eye. He loves you. And if you need an apple for your shoe, I've got some for you. Grab one, please. But come up and grab an apple just to remind you that God loves you. You are the apple of God's eye. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these amazing women that come on Wednesday night. I know some of them are tired. I know some of them have had hard days at work. I know some of them have maybe been homeschooling or carpooling or, Lord, you know everything about their lives. Father, you know some that have had great loss. And you know some that are going through great physical pain. Oh, God, would you in your sweetness and your kindness touch my friend? Father, would you remind my friend that, that she is the apple of your eye and that you love her and that you see her? And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, ladies, if you are new... 
and um, I know there are some new ladies. There's always wonderful new friends that join us. I want you to turn around and look back here. We have these black tablecloths, these tables that have black tablecloths on them, and those are community tables. And you are welcome to go to that table and have some great discussion with some new friends. I'm going to be standing over there if you need some help to find a community table. But I want to let you know you are loved here in this church, and you are, more importantly, you're loved by God. So come grab an apple, okay, if you need to know, if you need to have one. Okay, thanks, ladies. <laughs>